to have with us tonight, Richard Wilson from the Family Office Club, and he has a great presentation planned for you guys. But before we get into it, I do just have a couple of quick announcements um, at, at the beginning of this presentation. For those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Haley Gant. I am one of our IRA specialists, and I work pretty closely with the rest of our marketing department to help to put on these events for you guys. So in my quick little intro here, I'm going to walk you through just a quick overview of what we do at Quest, how we can help you, and some of our upcoming events that we have, which coming up in the spring, it is kind of normally our busy season, you know, gearing up for the tax filing deadline. And especially as we are all kind of coming out of last year, we're really excited to be hosting some of our events that will be coming up for you guys and some other events that we'll be attending as well. So just a quick little commercial about us, who is Quest? Quest is a self-directed IRA custodian based out of Houston, Texas. We do have clients all across the US, but physically our offices are based in Houston, Austin, and Dallas. So we're a pretty good sized company, got about a little over 100 employees um, between those three cities here in Texas. And we have about 20,000 clients nationwide. Now, for those of you guys who are interested in learning about self-directing your IRAs? How do you diversify your retirement account? You know, all of these different things that we like to teach about at Quest. Um, we have a lot of great resources for you. This is just one of the many webinars that we host, and we really pride ourselves on the accessibility that we provide to the self-directed IRA education, resources, guest speakers for you guys. So we're really excited to be hosting these events. We're excited to hopefully get back to some in-person events, you know, in our offices a little bit later this year. So be sure to keep an eye out for that. And as always, we do have to give our disclaimer, Quest does not give tax, legal, or investment advice. We provide a lot of education. We put out a lot of events, bring in a lot of different guest speakers, but please be aware to always do your own due diligence before entering into investments especially when you are dealing with your own IRA money or potentially dealing with other people's IRA money. You know, if you guys are doing deals together, you want to make sure that you are structuring things properly. You want to make sure that you are using professionals to structure your deals. You're not rushing into investments. And we really can't stress that enough because, you know, you really want to understand the role as your custodian to fund the investments. And your role as the client is to find the deals, do the structuring, and hopefully some of the education that we offer here at Quest can help to provide you a good idea about this. But again, always make sure that you are working with professionals and taking your time to make sure that you are doing things properly. Now, at Quest, you know, we teach people how to invest their IRAs into non-traditional assets, things such as real estate, notes, and private placement investments. Now, we see a lot of people that might roll over funds to Quest, maybe from an old 401k, or maybe transferring from a current IRA that you have at another custodian. But we also see a lot of people that start self-directing their IRAs with just their annual contributions. Now, I do like to include this in tonight's presentation because we are quickly approaching the tax filing deadline. Um, I'm sure most of you guys have probably heard it did actually get pushed back to May 17th of this year. So you do have just a little bit more time to not only file your 2020 taxes, but also to make your contributions for the 2020 tax year. Now, a little statistic that I kind of like to share is if you only contribute $6,000 a year to your IRA, which is currently the contribution limits, if you do that every year from age 25 to age 70, if your IRA only grows by 5% after adjusted for inflation, by the time you hit 70 years old, you will have just over a million dollars saved for retirement. And especially if you are starting out, or maybe if you're not eligible to roll over that 401k just yet, you, you know, maybe because you're still working at that job, every person out there should open up a Roth IRA. You should be maxing out your contributions every single year. And if you have questions about how to do this, be sure to reach out to us at Quest. Reach out to one of our IRA specialists. We are always neutral in the transaction. We're not financial advisors. We're not here to sell you investments. We are truly here to help educate you about the process and about all of the different options you have to actually take what you have available to you to invest with a retirement account 
and actually use that to get to where you need to be by the time you retire. So get those contributions in before the tax filing deadline, but even better, if you get your contributions in before the end of this month, which is about seven more days, um, we are doing a little Airbnb gift card giveaway where every $100 that you contribute to your IRA before the end of this month, you will get an entry to win a $200 Airbnb gift card. The original idea behind this promotion was to beat the rush before the tax filing deadline, and then they extended the deadline, but we're still doing the promotion, so you can really beat the rush if you get those contributions in before the end of the month. So online on tonight's webinar, we do have Kurt, one of our other IRA specialists. He is online moderating tonight. He specializes in helping our new clients not only learn about self-directed IRAs, but really be a good main one-on-one -on -one point of contact as you are making contributions, getting started with your account, and learning about all of these different options that you have. So switching gears a bit, I do just want to take a couple of minutes to focus in on our educational opportunities that we have coming up. Now, as I mentioned in the very beginning, this is just one of many classes that we host. We host a lot of different weekly webinars. We host a self-directed IRA Saturday series as well. And if you want to rewatch any of our recent presentations, you can find those on our YouTube channel. So our YouTube is a really great resource. We film new videos and post them every single week. And all of our educational classes that we host are archived on our YouTube channel as well. So be sure to check that out. Go subscribe, it really helps us out. And be sure to check out our other events as well. Our website is a great resource. We have classes, we have articles, we have blog posts. And I personally host a virtual networking happy hour every single month. It is on the first and third Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. It's completely through Zoom. And, you know, we've been doing it for a couple of months now, and it's really built up an awesome network of investors from pretty much all across the U.S. So if you are looking for deals, if you're looking to connect with other investors that are doing deals, you know, people that might be looking to invest with their IRA funds, be sure to join us for these happy hours. The next one is on Wednesday, April 7th, and they're a lot of fun. Come have a drink with me and 50 other investors and, you know, hopefully make some good connections. Now, my biggest kind of announcement or special that I have for you guys here tonight, um, if you've been watching our classes, you know we have a really big conference coming up here in April, and that is QuestCon Live. It is a full two-day online self-directed IRA conference. Now, also coming up this weekend, we are super excited to be um, a part of the Think Realty conference that is happening here in Houston, and it is actually a hybrid event, so it is happening online as well. If you buy your ticket to QuestCon before the end of this week, um, we've actually partnered with Think Realty, and you'll get a free ticket to the Think Realty conference. They have over 20 to 25 different guest speakers. It is in person in Houston. They do have limited tickets left in person, but they have actually partnered with um, a really high tech, cool AV company that is also putting the entire event online hybrid as well. So if you buy your ticket to QuestCon, you'll get a free ticket to the Think Realty Conference. And if you're not in Houston, you can attend online. And all of the sessions from Think Realty will be available after the weekend as well. So really great information here. We have two big events coming up. And Kurt is also putting in the chat a special link that not only can you get your tickets to both of these events, but if you use this link, it will automatically apply a 30% off discount on your QuestCon ticket. So uh, I forgot to write down exactly how much the QuestCon tickets are. Uh, we've had so much going on here lately with these events, but you can find all of that in the link. Buy your ticket to QuestCon. You'll get a free ticket to Think Realty. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you at both of those events. I will actually be emceeing the Think Realty event all day um, on Friday. So we're super excited to be linking up with them. And, you know, we also have a referral program. So if you know friends that need a self-directed IRA, send them over to Quest, make sure that they put your name on their application, and we will give both of you guys either a $50 credit if it's done by the end of the month, 
or we'll give you each a $25 credit. That is valid at any time. There's no limit to the number of clients that you refer to Quest. But I hope you guys take advantage of these resources. The main thing that I would love for you guys to join us um, in right now is QuestCon and that Think Realty event. We're super excited for both of those. There's a lot that goes into planning these events, and we're really excited to put on this quality education for you guys. So if you have questions, just reach out to us. Let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen here. And without further ado, I would like to bring on Richard Wilson from Family Office Club. Richard offers a lot of great education to um, real estate investors pretty much all across the U.S. He hosts his own educational events and has a lot of great resources. And so, Richard, we're super excited to have you here tonight. If you want to go ahead and come back on and share your screen, and uh, we're happy to have you here. I will come back on at the end for Q&A. So if you guys have questions, put them in that Q&A box and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Great, thank you Haley and welcome everybody. I don't have the uh, radio voice of Haley but hopefully I'll be sharing some good ideas with all of you today and I've enjoyed working with uh, Quest Trust to get to know them over the past couple of years. Um, before I get started, I'm just gonna enter in a uh, Dropbox link to some of my slides and the chat function there in case you just prefer to be able to go back and forth at your own speed in case you want to want to look at the slide more carefully. And let me share my screen now and follow along that way as well. There we go. You guys should be able to see the start of my slides here. So my talk today is on how to double your deal flow. And it sounds better just to say double your deal flow, but importantly, I think all of us want to double our high quality deal flow. We're going to get into exactly how you do that in this presentation. Uh, I'm only going to be speaking for maybe 35, maybe 40 minutes. So when they go pretty quickly uh, over these slides, um, anything that you have a question on, feel free just to stop me as we go. And you can submit something through the Q&A function in Zoom or through the chat function. And I'll try to keep an eye on that as we go. We'll also have some time for questions at the end. Um, just like Haley said, any webinar or podcast you listen to for the rest of your life, obviously don't do anything unless you know it's appropriate for you and your vehicle and for your situation. So you should go without, without saying. Um, picture of our team, nothing too exciting, but um, one important thing is that we've had over 1,000 family offices and ultra wealthy investors speak on stage at our 100, 150 live events that we've hosted. Um, I've met in person now with over 3,000 uh, ultra wealthy investors. We've helped set up about 100 family offices. Uh, last year, we closed on about $260 million of investment commitments, and I've made about 50 investments uh, myself, my own balance sheet. And we work with about 350, almost 360 investors uh, who have registered with us on InvestorClub.com. So when I talk about all of the ideas today, it's coming from that perspective of hosting a lot of live events, texting, calling, emailing my clients every day, structuring deals, and investing for myself. Um, so some of it at least will relate to your situation as well, I think. We have a podcast, the Family Office Podcast, um, and FamilyOffices.com. We get a lot of deal flow and interactions with investors through there. So we started out in 2007 talking about family offices. There weren't very many resources at all available in the industry at that time. Uh, we then started doing more work with single family offices and studying them, what are best practices, how do they invest their money, how do they structure their deals, we then started help setting up family offices and we helped set up, you know, family offices for families anywhere between the ages of, or between the net worth of 20 to $30 million for a virtual family office to hundreds of millions of dollars uh, with some clients. And then recently we wrote this book, Sense Millionaire Strategies. And some of the strategies you hear about today is going to be from uh, this book and the single family office book shown earlier. So first off, um, why would you want superior deal flow? Why would you want more deal flow? Um, and what are some of the themes around this that often come up with family offices? They pride themselves if they can be first to see a deal. Um, if they see deals most often, they might, because of their position, have exclusive access or have negotiated exclusive access to certain types of deals. And Many times they like to form partnerships or sell a company to a publicly traded company or a SPAC or to maybe even get deal flow by partnering with a publicly traded company that either does accounting or investment banking or advisory work with high quality companies 
that could be great deal flow for them as a family. One thing that we found is that the smartest clients we work with have a holistic approach to attracting quality deals. So they don't just think, oh, because of my network, I'm going to get good deals to come to me. They think, how could we position and brand our family office so that we attract more deal flow? For example, we work with a shark from Shark Tank. We helped create their family office uh, called Shark Family Office. Uh, it's um, already attracted deal flow. We've already closed one investment for them in the first 12 months working together. And that's an example of positioning for deal flow. Another example is being in different communities can help attract deal flow. And this could be part of the Quest uh, community. And on the first and third Wednesday of the month, doing the virtual cocktail hours with Haley or going to uh, the QuestCon events or other real estate events or family office club events, et cetera, and being in the right communities and always trying out two to four communities, maybe five at most, and dropping the one or two that are not as productive or enjoyable as the other ones is something I definitely encourage all of you to be doing. Many times people get in one community and they stay there for a very long time without trying out other ones and you can get 10 times the value from one versus another sometimes. Being proactive, acquiring choke points, we don't have time to talk about that today, and operating within your industry can help you get more deal flow. Mm -hmm. There are certain types of, of operating businesses that the byproduct is lots of deal flow. It's one of the reasons why we host live events. When we host 20 live events in a year and 6,000 people come, we get three things besides just money for operating that business. We get deal flow, investor relationships, um, and then we also get to have the access to those people who are, you know, raising capital and, and those relationships as well. And sometimes people miss that. And if you are a leasing agent or a real estate broker, you're going to see a lot of real estate deal flow, uh, et cetera. In every business, there's these people, whether they're valuation or appraisal experts or consultants on some level, that they get extra deal flow because they're in that space. Few reasons here on why you'd want to multiply deal flow in case it's not super obvious is just that if you see a thousand deals or if you see 50 deals, let's say 50, just imagine your top 10 deals compared to someone who sees five deals that don't even have a top 10, it'd be, you know, a uh, top 10% just 0.5 deals. So maybe out of their five, they got lucky and have one excellent deal, but even if you feel like your quality of deals is high, if you're not seeing dozens of deals per month or quarter, you're probably not getting great deals. You're probably not having your money sweat for you as much as it could. Um, and it'd be like if you got to interview 800 employees a year or 50 employees a year versus interviewing five employees. For those of you here that are a business owner, imagine if you could only interview five employees the whole year and pick one. You know, you really have to be very, very careful and maybe you're not going to like any of them um, versus having 50 people apply for a position, much more likely for it to work out. Um, you want to have a high conviction on the valuation and how to work on the deal. And that grows the more deals you see. If you are investing in like a deal we just closed in the dental clinic, if you're investing in dental clinics and you've only seen two dental clinic deals in your life versus you've seen 52 of them, then you're going to have higher conviction on the valuation, the due diligence process and how it compares to the average deal in the space or the average dental clinic or how it compares to other deals that you're seeing. If most deals are giving you a 8% income return um, and you've seen dozens and dozens and then somebody comes and only offers 6%, it might not look as good, but maybe the structure is so wise and it's so safe, you actually do like it better. Or it could be the opposite, you might be wise enough to know when is someone offering me 11% return um, and actually this has less risk than what a lot of people offer me at 8% return because I'm in first position, not in second position on the debt and the quality of the collateral is great and the track record is long and this is a fine. This is an anomaly out of the hundreds and thousands of deals that are out there. So there's more capital than ever before chasing deals. And so the best deals get closed relatively quickly. Um, and you need to see a lot of deals if you're gonna see uh, the best ones is typically how it goes. So it's important that you identify the size, the geography preferences, 
um, whether you need control in the deal or not, and figure out what is your strike zone for investing. A lot of people will spend money flying to a city and conducting due diligence on a deal, like I am here today. It's the Pier 1 Imports and you're on the wall in the Marriott and I'm sitting in here in Oklahoma City. Um, you know, they'll, they'll take an effort to come to a city like this to vet a deal just like I am today, um, but they won't spend any effort which costs them nothing, much less than a plane ticket, of just spending some time on an airplane diagramming exactly what is the strike zone for a great investment for them. And that's usually not something you can just download from your advisor and say, tell me what I should invest in, unless they've been working for you for a very long time. It's based on what you're interested in, what you could add value to, what you understand with um, arms distance deals you might not be allowed to add value to it. Um, you may um, have to have it be at arm's distance that you at least could understand what's going on in the deal because it's in an industry you understand or it's drawing upon expertise that you have or it's aligned with your risk appetite, your income needs, your goals, et cetera. So it's very important to do this because then people around you can protect you from wasting time. Also, people around you can refer deals to you that do meet your strike zone. You can have this on a website, whether you want your name publicly or have the name be kept private or not. And this can help attract deal flow to you. And then if people send you something, you can say, no, I'm sorry, that's a pass for us. We don't invest in startup mobile apps out of Singapore or whatever it is. Here's what we do invest in. And if it's a connector and it's someone that keep you in mind, then they might come back and say, oh, well, our other client is a Midwest-based you know, manufacturing company that's doing $1.5 million in revenue. Maybe that would be a good fit. And then they can bring you, they're more likely to bring you something that you can invest in. So there's a whole bunch of criteria that I'm showing on the screen here. Um, this is just some of the things that you may look for uh, when trying to narrow down what your strike zone is, just some of the ideas. And this slide is really showing a, a bell curve back from statistics, statistics class uh, during maybe college or high school you may have taken. Um, you may have learned that if you are one standard deviation away from the average, um, then it's less likely to, it's, le it's a less common event, um, and you're much less likely to see that type of a deal um, versus an average event. If you're two standard deviations away, it's a lot less likely. And if you're three standard deviations away, uh, then I believe it's under 0.5% chance that you're going to see a deal like that. And so the point of showing this is that if you see um, 10 or 20 deals, it's not even statistically relevant to be the shape of a bell curve. You have to be seeing 30, 50, 60, a couple hundred deals, and then you'll be able to recognize what is an anomaly, but it's a very personal thing. What is a great deal for someone else is not going to be a great deal for you. So you have to know yourself, your strengths, and your goals, but also you have to know that you can't swing at everything going by you you need to be seeing a mass amount of deals to be able to pick out where is something way over. Something could be an anomaly because they're just truly awful and they're not a good investment for you at all. And other things are just a 0.5% top quality deal. Um, and unless you see a couple hundred deals, it's hard, hard to get there. So anomaly deal flow is something that's not common, super aligned, it's a very compelling team. Almost every single case, the team is very, very compelling. It's either vertically or horizontally integrated sometimes. Sometimes it's dominating the niche. Uh, other times they're owning choke points or a critical bottleneck in an industry. Um, usually they're best in class or number one at something that's meaningful and tangible. Many times it has great momentum already. It's not a brand new idea. Lots of people are not getting excited about investing in their self-directed IRA or other hard-earned funds into somebody's dream that has nothing material to it yet. Um, it's exciting typically to learn about, and it's not super confusing, and you get very high conviction on it. If you can't meet a lot of these checkboxes, a lot of these things describe what a lot of anomaly deals look like, then sometimes it's just time to move on to the next deal. To position for extra deal flow, we've found there's many things that a family office can do. An investment firm can do many of these things as well. Um, the first is have a super clear one-liner on exactly what you're looking to invest in. So if you are a Chicago-based family office that invests in $1 million to $5 million in revenue manufacturing companies, then you might want to say whether you invest as a minority owner or a majority kind of buyout investor. 
um, but let's say it's a minority investor, then that would be a way to describe what you do very clearly and attract more deal flow to you. Um, or it might just be that you're looking for passive investments that produce 10 10% plus a year in cash flow. Um, and you, you like low risk investments and that could be your one liner. It depends on whether you're really looking at this webinar here tonight as something that is gonna help you formalize your investing uh, just within your self-directed IRA. And you're just, look, just looking for one or two ideas for that. Or are you worth you know, three, five, seven, ten million dollars and or you soon will be, and you really need to be formalizing a bit more your investment. So it's not just a rental property or two, and then your self-directed IRA or an HSA account, et cetera, but something a little bit more sophisticated to attract better deals. The more so that you're leaning towards that, a little bit more sophisticated approach, the more you can use some of these strategies to really dial up your deal flow. And almost all the strategies here tonight uh, cost you nothing but time, intentionality, clear communication, and then they'll give you an ROI of having your money sweat for you harder versus not using these strategies. Next thing that we've done many times is drawing out our deal flow blueprint. Uh, we have one division of investorclub.com that focuses on doctors and dentists uh, called the Doctors Investor Club. And we're literally mapping this out in our office right now on a whiteboard and pointing out the different influencers we know, the different groups that we're part of, um, the different deals that we're working on, the different places where in the industry we could uh, be more influential uh, and connect with people where they are going and what media they're reading, et cetera. And if you're trying to attract manufacturing deal flow in Chicago, what state of Illinois manufacturing owner associations are there? Is there one that costs $10,000 a year? Kind of weeds out the absolute startups and small companies. Um, there's one business owner club I'm part of that is a $50,000 a year membership and we just meet up once a quarter. But guess what? The member quality is very high. Um, so trying to stay away from memberships that are too inexpensive, they'll end up with uh, wasted time, but finding something practical for the level of investor that you're at, whether that's $5,000, $7,000 a year uh, membership in an industry specific or investment uh, type specific group could be one of the many communities you become part of. But mapping it out visually can be really helpful to people like me who are more visual so they can understand where they're going next, what the game plan is, and at a glance, you're basically saying a thousand words to your team and yourself about what, what your map is on the terrain that you're going to navigate to get more deal flow. And, and at the end of the day, it's about making more effective investments um, and becoming smarter on structure, what's a valid market rate return. Um, and if you are informed by other people of these things, they'll inform you in a way that helps their kids go to college, um, perhaps not in a way that's going to serve you best. So I've had people come to me and say, oh, we give a 6% preferred return on our real estate investments, and we take 50% of profits. And that's industry standard. I have others come to me and say that they provide an 8% preferred return to their investors and only take 20% of profits. You know, one of those deals is a lot more lean than the other one, and they're both acting like it's industry standard. So if you don't see a lot of deals, you don't know what's what and they do, and then it's to their advantage. Um, a proactive data run this is one of my favorite strategies because it costs very little and can produce excellent results. So let's say you want to invest in dry cleaners in San Diego um, and you say, well, I'm not sure. There's only two on the market from these two different brokers and there's many bids on them and the price seems a little bit high, et cetera. And maybe it's a rush process and you want to attract some or do a deal where it's not a competitive process. You could hire somebody on a website called uh, upwork.com if you wanted to um, and have them help you research how many dry cleaners are in San Diego. Maybe actually just like three different zip codes better than the rest and figure out, oh, there's 67 dry cleaners in those zip codes, figure out the name of their companies, figure out what their website is, have someone research the contact details, reach out, call, email, visit them in person and build up this database of 67 dry cleaners. You'll be able to figure out who the owners are and at least 25 of those, if not more. You can look up who owns the domain names, you can look up in county records who owns the real estate. Um, if they're inside a piece of real estate and you, you don't think they're leasing it, and there's different ways to build up databases of real estate assets, of companies, we've done this. 
many times, and we did it one time on um, a consumer product niche. We identified 370 assets for potential acquisition. Um, I got personally on the phone with 70 of them. Uh, I learned a ton. It was over about eight months. Um, eight of them I determined were investable, I thought. Um, I brought one that I thought was ready for an investment to my client who had me on retainer to help them uh, find this deal flow. The client said, no, we don't like it. And I said, really? I, I really like the deal. I think it's amazing. Uh, do you mind if I just invest in it then and you guys don't want to be part of it? And they said, yeah, go ahead. That's fine. So I ended up um, acquiring a third of that consumer products company because I like the end result on the deal so much. And since then, uh, we've closed on three more investments based on what we learned from that process and deal flow from that process. And now four years later, a few of those companies still keep in touch with us and we may still close another transaction from that one-time effort of reaching out in this focused way and saying, okay, what's the universe of potential investment assets we could target? And it could be two city blocks and you wanna buy up all the real estate and assemble a package there over time. Um, it could be dry cleaners, it could be just about anything, SaaS companies, companies on Amazon, et cetera. And if you do this process, first of all, most investors won't, so you'll have that advantage. But if you do this process, then you will learn a ton and you'll get more deal flow. And it'll be deal flow that from the beginning meets your strike zone because you decide who to approach. You're not saying, oh, I want to invest in dry cleaners. And people send you a dry cleaner from Nigeria and one from Toronto and one from Houston. Um, you're just going laser focused on one county, one zip code or one city and one type of business or asset or online asset, et cetera, and building up your own database of uh, deal flow that you're going to make things happen on. And the beauty of that sometimes can be that the price is unknown, uh, the valuation is unknown, and sometimes the owner will say, well, what do you think my company is worth? And you get to have a conversation about it. That's light years different than somebody shopping a glossy pitch deck um, and they're going out to 92 potential bidders, and now you're part of an auction on eBay um, the difference is going to a garage sale and finding an antique that is, you know, maybe it's not massively mispriced, but it's not efficiently priced versus going on eBay or going to Christie's uh, for an art auction and you're competing against hundreds of people to buy an asset. Big difference. You also want to think about where are there barrels of fish? In other words, where are there really concentrated um, groups of deal flow that are all grouped together? And that way you can be moving faster uh, on the potential investment. So one example is if there is an association group and it's an association of stem cell uh, investors and business owners and funds, and they had an annual event and maybe there's only six events across the US on, on that niche or it's probably much more, but let's say there's only six, well, then you might be able to figure out which one or two are the highest quality and speak of those events or help run an association that caters to them or volunteer and be part of a group, uh, whether it's a nonprofit group locally uh, or something else where a lot of the leads are in one place. And whenever you can identify that, then you can move faster on getting more deal flow. Focusing geographically can help a lot. Uh, we've got one member of our investor club who only buys one type of asset. It's a real estate type of asset and only in Times Square in New York. Uh, he only buys it within a half mile of Times Square. So he's identified all the assets there and knows who the people are. And because that geographical focus for one part of his portfolio, um, it allows him to move faster and capture deals and be known on a first name basis by those asset owners. Obviously it's almost never a good idea to take one type of asset and then just have that be a huge amount of your portfolio that's concentrated risk that typically um, you do not want to be taking. So I don't want to read that the wrong way, but for part of your portfolio, it can really help to focus geographically where you can add strategic value. Building your deal finder network is another way to get a lot of deal flow. You can find ways that in a regulatory approved fashion, you can pay people to bring you deals and you pay them at the closing. It could be a real estate broker. Um, it could be under uh, some license they have that allows you to pay them or there might be an exclusion to licenses. If you're the majority owner investing in an asset that they bring you. And there's a lot of examples in our club. Um, I give a couple here written out in case someone wants to go back to look at that with the PowerPoint slide I provided. Um, if you can get a network of people finding deals for you, then that can change everything. And I've met a billionaire who became such because of having 85 people 
uh, finding him deals constantly and the amount of deals he was able to close through that. So here are some different strategies that we've talked a little bit about, and we're going to talk about a little bit more here on doubling your deal flow. The first one is making sure you identify your strike zone. A lot of people can't say in a sentence exactly what they want to invest in. I'll spend an hour long meeting just trying to tease out what do you actually want to invest in with an investor. And these are people that are worth sometimes 50 million, a couple hundred million dollars, and I haven't spent the time to communicate this clearly, which is silly, it costs absolutely nothing. So you should be able to say, I like passive income investments that have hard collateral behind them and produce a 10% return or higher, but I also made my money in industrial. So I like both industrial real estate and manufacturing companies generally in the Midwest and between the values of X and Y or when I can have a control position, et cetera. So being able to say that puts you ahead of a lot of people that spend time going to events trying to find deal flow, but then somebody asks them what they're looking for and they're like, yeah, we'll look at anything. Well, then you're going to get sent nothing first. You're going to get sent everything last or which is with a mob of people. What you want is someone to see a deal and say, oh, I'm going to show that to John because exactly what he said he was looking for. And there's always nuances to every strike zone. So it oftentimes you still have to look at a lot of deals to get one done, but it's going to help everyone if you're a clear communicator. So positioning, having a visual blueprint, doing a data run, having a database of deals, uh, finding barrels of fish where a lot of deals are in one room, or one community, and that's going to make it very easy to get things done, focusing ge geographically and building finder network. Those are seven different ideas to double your deal flow. And I'm happy to uh, take questions in a minute or two. I just have a few more slides here, though. Um, a couple examples of anomaly deal flow. Um, none of these are a pitch uh, for investment. These are just examples that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, but one example is that one of my clients owns um, over 100 uh, burger franchise restaurant locations. They do about a million dollars a year each in revenue. And being able to be a minority investor in such a large deal is just a unique opportunity. Uh, another example is a life settlement niche. A lot of you know that area. Um, Right now on the screen here, you can tell us from four or five years ago, it says 12 to 14% returns. Usually it's more like 10 to 12% returns for a diversified life settlement firm you know, nowadays. Um, but that's just a really unique investment that doesn't act like the stock market or real estate or interest rates, uh, et cetera. It moves based on different metrics. Um, another example is a fintech company that I invested in. The CEO had built a $100 million fintech company doing the exact same thing or a large bank, and then he left. And now instead of having one or 2% equity, he has 65% equity and he's a whole lot more motivated. And he's built the exact same business up to a hundred million dollar valuation. You don't find that too often. Usually it's someone who has a health tech, health tech mobile app and they're gonna change the healthcare industry and they were a hospital CFO before. But they didn't build the exact same company before in the same industry, et cetera. So these are just examples of things that when you look at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of deals, uh, they still pop out and they stand up against that. And that, that's really what you want. And that's kind of the value of connecting with other investors here at, at Quest Trust is the value of going to events and being part of the community that you always wanna pick up new structures, new ways to align all of the parties involved, new strategies for negotiating a deal, new ways of sourcing a deal, new ways of improving the upside on an investment and getting your money out faster or de-risking it or structuring it so that your downside is protected more. Um, and that's something that you can negotiate and structure into deals over time. The more that you recognize that when you see a lot of deals, you're always learning a little bit about what you liked about a deal, even if you have to say no to it. One thing we do to track our deals for clients that we're doing a heavy search for is a deal tracking dashboard. You can get fancy software for this. We use Asana for it uh, sometimes, and then we can track what stage of due diligence it's at and what the deal priority is. And that way, if we're looking at 40 deals with somebody, we can say, okay, well, these five deals are rating number one out of three. This is the stage of due diligence. And here's the last time we touched base on that deal with that counterparty. A lot of times people only want to look at two to five deals at one point in time. And then a back burner other ones while they have their lead deal or two or top one to five deals. But it's important to note that some deals you're better off 
you know, getting to know them over a year and a half or two years and seeing if they do what they promised they would do, if they grew in revenue like they thought they would. Um, and then you can have notes in there of why you said no or why you think it's time that you should wait uh, and then follow up later. And then that way you won't waste time digging into something you've already said no to for a good reason. Um, so that completes the main portion of what I wanted to talk about. I guess the last, last comment I would make is just that most investors don't know how poor their deal, deal flow is um, because they're new to investing or relatively new to it. They may have a business that they, they own and that they're still operating. Um, and they haven't experienced, you know, seeing 100 deals a year, 300 deals a year. So how would they know that that's what they should be gearing towards versus knowing about 12 different investments per year and then, you know, picking one or two and hoping that they're great. Um, they may be, um, especially if you're in really high quality communities, they may be, but you just don't want to leave that to chance because many of us have worked, you know, so hard to create any wealth that we do have. You don't want to do yourself an injustice by quickly allocating it to the first thing that walks by. You know, you want to take a, a more sophisticated approach and develop strategies over time to see more deals, structure better deals, and just be constantly evolving in that virtuous circle of learning new strategies, structures, investment opportunities, and, and draw upon those experiences in each deal that you negotiate or conduct due diligence on. So um, I'm going to turn off my screen share in about five seconds here uh, and just take questions. Um, I've got a bunch of free books if anybody would like, um, a book on single family offices, a book on capital raising, a book on how to start a family office, um, or have questions about anything and you just don't want to ask it on chat or in front of everybody, feel free just to shoot me an email. It's just richard at investorclub.com, which you can see here on the screen. And um, turn off the screen share now and see what questions anyone has. Yeah, definitely an awesome. Richard, that's such great information because I feel like the principles you covered tonight, no matter where you might be in your investment journey, whether you're brand new or whether you're, you know, accredited, really high level, these principles can be applied to, you know, matter where you might be looking for your deals. So great information. Thank you for sharing that with us. Great. Yeah, no problem, Haley. And um, I think that a lot of investors can get a big ROI out of basically nothing being invested but their time. But they're just a little bit more um, explicit on exactly what they're trying to attract. And then the world knows what to send them. And if I know that, that you, Haley, are looking for dry cleaners to invest in, then, you know, I'll be keeping you in mind. That's a unique thing, right? And we all have unique things about us. We all create our wealth and by being a chiropractor or an attorney or, or something of that nature. So I think not being like every other investor at a big conference and you're like, oh yeah, I'm just looking for cash flow. Or like, oh, real estate. I like real estate. You know, it just doesn't really serve anybody being generic like that, including yourself. Mm -hmm. It's so true. And we have a really good question from one of our attendees. Um, it's a little bit of a longer question, so feel free to pull up the q and I'll read it out loud. But Kaysen yeah. wants to know, um, you know, first, thanks for the presentation tonight. You said there is more capital than ever. However, we have more deals than money. We're having trouble finding investors for large note pools, like 25 million plus. Is your investor club membership a good place to spend time? You know, are you guys specifically looking for notes? Do you have any in, in, input there? Yeah, sure. So um, appreciate the question. So many different answers to that. I'll try to be very concise here. So first of all, um, there's a lot of investors sitting on a lot of cash, but investors want to invest with people that they've gotten to know, like, and trust in strategies they've gotten high conviction on because they can typically understand the strategy. Hopefully it can be shown very visually. Um, now with everybody getting vaccinated who wants to very soon, um, we'll be able to meet in person again, but investors typically move forward on things that are, uh, up three different trust curves, the trust curve of the relationship with the CEO or founder. They, the second one is trust in the industry and they're familiar with the industry. And the next one is trust in a deal that's local and they could go walk the deal, see the deal, understand it and go drive by the site. And if you only raised capital from people who made money in the dry cleaning business only in Austin, Texas. Um, and you, your only thing was getting them to know you, then you're only down that trust curve on the 
uh, team and you're already up to two other curves, you're probably going to get deals closed. But if you're going to people that don't understand real estate, don't understand notes, they're not local to you and they don't know you, then it's very hard. So um, I would say that our, our investor club, we have a family office club, which is really designed with our charter membership for people raising capital. If you wanted to you know, check out membership there, for sure it would be a value. But I would make sure that you realize that a lot of people come to an investor club and they're looking for fish and they have their, their, their fishing pole out there and their pitch deck is kind of, or their teaser is kind of their bait and they're hoping to get a fish. And that's fine. Like we have investors that come to our events, West Trust, obviously as many investors at their events. Um, but the value that people miss or discount up front, but sometimes see the most value in is that when we do our workshops and our training programs, uh, the strategies we provide can help you with building five fishing nets using 10 types of different bait to figure out what's the right type of bait for the type of fish you're trying to approach and what your strengths are as a person in a team. And it's the strategies that can help you attract a hundred investors. They're going to be more valuable than like, Oh, where's the next fish? Does this guy have a fish for me? Can this one refer one to me? Like you want to build up your whole system so that the fish are flowing towards you and your position like a grizzly bear in the waterfall. So the fish are jumping towards you not you chasing a fish here, chasing a fish there. And um, the people newer to the industry always want a fish and they don't care as much about the strategies, ironically, even though that would be what, what really helps them. So um, I would just encourage people to you know, understand that if you are raising capital and then uh, the family office club is what we've been running for 14 years and where we host 20 live events, investorclub.com is just for investors, not people raising capital. Um, just so there's not confusion around that. I think Giovanna's next question was, what was the website again? And Family Office Club is at familyoffices.com. Investorclub.com is that. You know, so I um, just wanted to make, make that clear. I'm happy to answer any other questions that people have here. Yeah, and Kaysen, I totally agree. That, that was a really great answer. And it's such a great way to explain it because it is so true. So many investors, whenever they get in this business, they're like, where's the next deal? How do I find this? If I send out X amount of mailers, maybe I'll get a deal. But, you know, kind of taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture to truly set up those systems and align yourself with the right people who can help create those systems is a really great way to go about it, which kind of does lead me into and I have a few questions here that I had, actually. Um, so how do I know if it's time for me to join a family office club, if I should join investor club, you know, do I have to have a certain amount of experience, you know, and do I have to be accredited? How does that type side of it work? Sure. So for family office club, if you're raising capital, anything more than a hundred thousand dollars, which I'm sure, you know, most people are, if they are, um, family office club could be enormously helpful um, because of everything I talked about, but also we've interviewed 66 people so far that have raised hundred million dollars or more. And they all give a 10 minute talk on how they raised hundred million dollars plus. And you could go find 66 people who have raised hundred million plus, but then convincing them to have a cup of coffee with you and not pitch you their gold fund and actually tell you how they raised capital and that much capital would be tough. And our next event um, in July um, on that topic, because we have two events a month, uh, will feature another 34 experts who have all raised $100 million plus, all giving a 10-minute talk. And, you know, we have about 10 different things in membership, but honestly, just that, finding 100 people who have all raised $100 million plus, like, I don't know anywhere else you can find it. So definitely, if you're raising capital, the um, reason why we have a $1 trial to our membership is we find that most people like it once they get in there and then they stick and they just have a hesitation on, on checking out the charter membership with us on investorclub.com. Um, it's free to join. There's no cost to join. It takes three to four minutes to register. And we designed this after listening to investor complaints for a decade at our events about misaligned counterparties, about high fees. So our only fee is a profit share when you make money on investments you do through investorclub.com. And if you do two or three different investments through us, and let's say one did not make you money or one lost you 5%, and another one, you know, made you 5% or made you 20%, um, any losses are netted out before we have any profit share fee. So we can't be, you know, if you go to an investment bank or like a big private bank, they might put you in three different funds. And each fund is going to charge you 2% management fee, 
percent profit share or performance fee, they call it. And if one of those loses your money, they're still going to charge you the full boat on the other two. And even the one that lost your money will charge you the 2% management fee in almost every case. And we just saw that as broken. It's almost like investors should be the ones getting paid for forking their money over until they get a return. I mean, what have they gotten besides an opportunity cost of now their money's tied up in something? Um, so we just think that's a little bit backwards in our industry. And that's why we've structured um, the deals that we have. And then the last thing about that is that there's about a thousand angel investor clubs out there that invest in startups and some gal or guy with an idea and a dream. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we're focused on non startups. Um, so things that are cash flowing, making money, just because I don't like things that are binary where you might get 30 times return or they're going to lose all your money. You know, like sometimes deals, no matter how well established, can go wrong and go sideways. But when you get out of the startup world and you actually focus an investor club on things that make money already, you know, it simplifies things a bit and then you can structure things around cash flow and income and tax efficiency, uh, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Awesome, which actually kind of, again, leads right into my next question. So I've heard you mention dry cleaners a lot. I'm not sure if you just use that as an example or what is your like favorite type of preferred investment that you like? You know, do you like dry cleaners specifically or, um, you know, what, what are you looking at? And maybe has that changed in the past couple of years due to just everything going on in the world? Sure. Um, I like uh, local cash flowing real estate. So I happen to be based in Phoenix and multifamily um, or another type of cash flowing commercial real estate, you know, I definitely like. I just think there's a peace of mind having hard assets and lands that produces cash to your name. But um, a lot of people like that, so it's not a very interesting answer. I think more uh, so lately has been medical clinics, dental clinics, healthcare companies that have done well and been stable or grown during the pandemic. Um, And specifically, um, I'm here in town looking at a chain of um, five clinics that do 8 million a year in revenue is what I'm doing due diligence on here in town today. And last year we closed was a $15 million a year dental clinic chain uh, that's profitable and growing. And so those types of investments, uh, medical, dental, doctor uh, chains or networks are definitely uh, of interest in case anyone has access to deals like that or would like to chat about that sometime. Definitely happy to to share because we're doing a lot of work with um, doctors and dentists right now. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. Especially those doctor's offices. It's, it hasn't been important before. It's definitely important today. Um, someone did ask a question about UBIT, unrelated business income tax. Um, reach out to us directly here at Quest. Um, Richard, I don't know if you want to touch on UBIT at all. I know you like that uh, topic just a little bit. I know we've talked about it before, but you know, you, you look at a lot of different types of deals. Do you see UBIT as a concern at all or anything like that? Yeah, we definitely see it as a concern. Um, and, you know, I've heard of some people who set up a, you know, a blocker and there's, you know, some people there have sophisticated ways of maybe um, working around that through a smart structure. So just keep your eyes open for people that have figured that out and make sure you get a second, third opinion on whether they really have figured it out or not, of course. Um, and then, you know, we have interviewed um, you, Haley, as part of our 100 tax expert interview series. We're about 55 interviews deep into that. And I think that all else equal, the other thing I'm always keeping an eye open for are just deals that have some option of doing some tax planning around it. Um, It could be that the deal is going within a tax protected account. So it may not be critical for all of your investments, but otherwise looking at, you know, bonus depreciation, cost segregation, and different strategies that you could potentially take advantage of as an investor or ways to structure a deal if you're raising capital to be more tax efficient um, can pay a lot of dividends and help a deal get to a close faster. So that's something of particular interest this year. Um, when we saw that Biden was coming into office, we started that interview series, and um, we were you know grateful for you being being part of that, and um, so appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Great answer. It's a lot of times whenever we get people that ask UBIT questions here, sometimes our guest speaker is like, please don't make me go into UBIT, but I, I know you know just a little bit about it, so <laughs> happy to ask that one. Um, Kaysen also wants to know, how do we get the free books that you mentioned? You have oh, several. sure. I'm happy to um, email over um, those PDFs, whichever ones you'd like access to. Uh, just shoot me an email. It's just richard at investorclub.com. And then I can send those over to you. And um, most of them are for sale on 
on Amazon, but we'll just give them away for, for free in a PDF format. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So great resources there. Um, and Richard, you know, we've already kind of mentioned this, but you do a ton of education. Do you, um, well, first of all, you will actually be one of our speakers at QuestCon here coming up in a few weeks. So we're really excited to have you be a part of that event with us. Um, but kind of, you know, let us know what events do you have coming up? How do people, you know, I assume it's probably through the website, but kind of give us a little tidbit about what you have coming up as far as your educational events. Yeah, sure. So um, we do 20 live events a year and our next event is a real estate investor co-GP and joint venture summit on March 31st. Um, we then have a workshop on April 9th, which is our influence and persuasion workshop. So it's called Investor Influence. And it's about how to position yourself to attract more deal flow, attract more capital, and have your everything from your logo and branding to a book you write to a speech you give be a little bit more influential at each turn uh, to get more done with your time. Uh, we then in April 20th have an ultra wealthy investor summit. We then are doing a Capital Raising 101 workshop in May. And then we're doing a really fun event in, uh, later in May called the Future of Real Estate. We're going to talk about tokenization and NFTs and um, where real estate is going in terms of fractionalization and security tokens and just what maybe AI and machine learning will do to the real estate industry. And we run a platform called commercialrealestate.com and that really you know, fuels the community behind hosting our quarterly real estate events. But 16 of our 20 events a year are not just real estate focused for people that are outside that niche. And if anyone wants to um, check out what events we have coming up, it's just at familyoffices.com is the full schedule. Awesome. So guys, again, that website is familyoffices.com. I actually personally am going to go there after this because some of the topics that you teach about, it's really great to continue to get that higher level education. So Richard, it's been really great to have you here. Um, You know, I love the information that you offer and the way that it can be applied to not just real estate investing, but as our clients continue to grow their wealth and grow their portfolios, continuing to, you know, keep that path of, you know, building more streams of income and doing it better, creating those systems. So Richard, before we sign off for the night, do you have any last kind of closing thoughts or piece of advice that you'd like to leave our audience with here for tonight? Um, I think the last thing would just be to see enough deals that you can get very high conviction. And if you're not sure on something, then just take your time to get to know the team better and trust your gut because many times you might be hesitant about doing something and you might not be sure why. And it could just be that you need to see more deals, you know, find out that was, that is the right deal for you. And other times, you know, your gut was telling you to run the other direction because there was something that seemed off, you know, trust wise with the counterparty. And it's always better to, you know, let one go by, then move forward if you're not really, you know, sure about the team. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, that is a great last piece of advice to leave everyone with because it's so true. You know, sometimes your gut tells you things before you might actually realize it. Richard, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This has been extremely educational. If you guys want to re-watch tonight's class as well as any other webinar that we host here at Quest, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. Share these classes with your friends. If you thought they were helpful, um, let us know. Be sure to tell other people in your network and join us at our upcoming events. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night. And to everyone else out there, I hope you'll have a great night as well. Thanks, Haley. Take care, everyone.